In this video, I want to talk about how to solve equations involving radicals of some kind. And there's two important cases you have to pay attention to. There is when the index of the radical is odd versus even. Uh, the two will behave uh, very different in important ways. So some things to know about, like if you take y equals the cube root of x or any odd power, some of the important things to remember here is that the domain of this number is going to be all real numbers, the domain of this function. There is no number we're forbidden to take the cube root of. We can take the cube root of negatives. There's not a problem with that whatsoever. So for example, the cube root of negative 8 is equal to negative 2 because negative 2 cubed is equal to negative 8, right? So the domain is going to be all real numbers. The range is also going to be all real numbers. There is Every number can come out of a cube root. So if you end up with something like the cube root of x equals, let's say, negative 2, you don't have to disqualify them like, oh, no solutions. Like, no, actually, that's completely kosher. Take, cu uh, take the cube of both sides, you end up with x equals negative 8. Okay, so the domain range has no restrictions. That makes solving this thing a lot easier. Another thing important about the cube root of x is that it's a one-to-one -one function. So it's a truly invertible function. So in order to solve this equation, you're just going to start undoing operations. Um, in reverse order. So we do first what's outside of the cube root here. We're going to add 2 to both sides, and we end up with the cube root of 2x minus 4 is equal to 2. So it's equal to a positive number, but even if it equal a negative number, that wouldn't be a problem whatsoever. How are you going to get rid of the cube root? Well, you have to do its inverse operation. The opposite of the cube root would be the third power. So we're going to cube both sides, and we end up with 2x minus 4 equals 2 cubed, which is 8. And now it's a linear equation, which we're probably very comfortable at this point. Um, we're going to add 4 to both sides. We get 2x equals 8 plus 4, which is 12. Then we're going to divide both sides by 2. And we end up with x equals 6 as our solution, for which we can double check to make sure if we take the cube root of 2 times 6 minus 4, and we subtract 2 from that here, you'll notice 2 times 6 is equal to 12, like we saw before. 12 minus 4 is 8. The cube root of 8 is 2, and 2 minus 2 is 0. And so we do see that the left-hand side agrees with the right-hand side. We have a solution. And so when you're working with odd radicals, there's really not a lot of difficulties. Because the function, its domain is all real numbers, its range is all real numbers, and it's one-to-one, -one, there's really no, there's no obstacles. There's no, no traps you have to look out for. So let's focus the remainder of this video then on even radicals. So we're talking about like, square roots or fourth roots or sixth roots. Uh, what happens when you try to solve things like that? Well, some things to be aware of, like if you take y equals the square root of x, first of all, its domain is only going to be 0 to infinity, if we want to think of it as like a, a real valued function. And we've dealt with this issue before uh, as we worked with quadratic functions back in uh, chapter 3 in this series, that if you take the square root of a negative, you're going to end up with some imaginary number, right? And so if you're willing to con consider all, uh, all complex solutions, that kind of relaxes the domain problem. If we're trying to graph this thing, we definitely need to restrict the domain just so we only get real numbers. So whether we include whether we include imaginary complex solutions or not will depend on whether we want to relax this condition on the domain. It is an issue, but it's not too much of an issue. We've, we've dealt with it before. Um, a bigger concern for us will be the issue with the range. The range of a square root function, and this would also be true for like the fourth root, right? If you remember the graph of these functions, the square root function would look something like the following. This would also be the basic graph for the fourth root. Looks something like this. You only see things above the x-axis, nothing below. So its range is going to be only the non-negative real numbers. This is important because if you run across something like the sixth root of x equals negative 1, right, we cannot go past this. This would actually mean no solution uh, because a sixth root could never equal a negative. A fourth root is square root. They can never equal negatives. So if you ever get um, an even root to equal a negative, there's no solution. Much like if you get the absolute value of x to equal negative 1, right? That's not possible. Um, so you get no solution. That's a concern we have to deal with as well. So we have to always be cautious. We always have to be cautious that when we're solving an equation involving square roots or any even radical, we have to make sure we have legit uh, numbers from the range there. So when you look at like the square root of x minus 1, well, this is only solvable if x minus 7 is positive or 0, right? 
Um, if it were negative, you aren't going to get any solution. So, but that depends on x, right? There's some values of x that'll be positive, some that won't be, right? It would only it would only be acceptable like when x is greater than or equal to seven, right? But on the other hand, when you look inside the radical, right, it has a restriction on its domain as well. Um, so that has to be x is greater than or equal to one, which isn't, which you know that's compatible, right? It just we take the more restrictive thing right here. But this can get very confusing paying attention to domains and ranges. So what I want to suggest is a much simpler approach. When you take your equation, the square root of x minus one equals x minus seven. What my suggestion is this stuff about domains and ranges. I'm giving you permission to to procrastinate. It's like eh, I'll clean up my room later, mom. Uh, we'll do that later. So when you see the square root of x minus one right here, to get rid of the square root, we have to do the inverse operation, which is gonna be squaring it. We have to square both sides. On the left-hand side, you're gonna get x minus one because the square of the square root is an x minus one. On the right-hand side, we do have to FOIL. x minus seven squared means x minus seven times x minus seven. And so when you have things like this, x minus seven to any power, the binomial theorem can come into hand, it can be very handy in doing these expansions here. The left-hand side will look like, excuse me, the right-hand side will look like x squared minus 14x plus 49. Now we've turned our equation into a quadratic equation. I'm gonna move everything to the right-hand side. We're gonna minus x and add one to both sides, minus x and add one. This then gives us x squared minus 15x, plus 50 is equal to zero. We could solve this by the quadratic formula or we could um, just factor it, it turns out. Factors of 50 that add to be 15, we could do 10 and five, make both of them negative. So we're gonna get x minus 10, x minus five is equal to zero. And that would then tell us our solutions look like x equals 10 or five. So we end up with two solutions here, but one has to be very cautious, right? Remember what I said earlier, that the square root of x minus one is only gonna work if the right-hand side was positive, or, or zero, zero is okay there too. Uh, it, it can't be negative, but the right-hand side will only be positive when you're greater than seven. So that observation right there was like, wait a second, five, what do you think you're doing here? You're not invited, you're not greater than seven. Right, so actually x equals 10 is gonna be the solution to this radical equation right here. X equals five is what one calls an extraneous solution, um, which I'm probably mispronouncing here. It's a fancy word that's kind of hard to say um, if you don't know how to pronounce words with more than five letters in it or anything like that. But anyways, th this idea that five, it looked like it was a solution, but it's really not. This is actually what I like to call a party crasher. Uh, the idea is they were not invited to the party. They weren't invited to the wedding, but they snuck in there anyways. So how did how did five sneak into this? How did it sneak into this process? Well, the issue really comes down to when we were dealing with the square root, we had to deal with a square at one moment. Consider the very simple equation, x equals two. I think we all can solve this equation right here. The solution to x equals two is x equals two, great. But what happens if you square both sides of the equation? You're gonna square the left, you'll get x squared. You'll square the right, you get four. And then as you solve this equation, you end up with two solutions, x equals plus or minus two, uh, the plus or minus two. So you get these part, this party crash or negative two that sneaks into the game, it sneaks into the party, even though it wasn't invited at all. And this has to do with the fact that these even radicals are not one-to-one -one functions. This also had the issue with its with its range, right? These things are not one to one, uh, but really, you know, it's this issue with the range here. We can't accept a negative number. But when you when you square things, you're kind of forgetting that the inverse of the fourth root is actually a not one to one function. It'd be the y equals y, y to the fourth. And so this these issues here means that party crashes can sneak into the party here. But that's something that's easy to deal with if you take the original equation, the equation that was not you know defiled by the filthy hands of man. If you take the square root of x minus one equals x minus seven, well, let's actually try my two, my two possible solutions here. Let's take the square root of 10 minus one and compare it to 10 minus seven. What happens? Well, 10 minus one is nine. 10 minus seven is three. And on the right-hand side, the square root of nine does turn out to be three. Oh, so that one actually does work out. The left-hand side agrees with the right-hand side. So we see that 10 worked. On the other hand though, 
if we take the square root of 5 minus 1, uh, does this equal 5 minus 7? Well, you can see the problem here. The square root of 5, uh, take 5 minus 1, you're going to 4. The square root of 4 is going to equal 2. On the right-hand side, though, you're going to get 5 minus 7, which is negative 2. And negative 2 does not equal does not equal 2. And so that's that issue about a square root can't equal a negative. So this party crasher snuck into the game because of that. So when you're working with radical equations, it's imperative that you check for party crashers. Even if you did all of your algebra correct, right? We did all of our algebra correct. We can have party crashers. And so we have to check for them. And that's because of these, this range issue going on right here. Now you can try to identify the party crasher by making one statement about, oh, the right-hand side has to be positive. But as the more complicated these functions get, the more difficult it can be to determine what is the appropriate domain uh, to make all of this well-defined. So I just say, don't even worry about this stuff about domain and range. Just solve the equation and then check your solutions. Honestly, you should be doing that anyways. Check your solution. But it's necessary that with radical functions, radical equations, you need to check your solutions. Otherwise, you might not, you might have these extra numbers in there. And that's the thing, like with this one, we, we, we had to square things. And we got two solutions from the quadratic. Turned out one of them worked, the other one didn't. Sometimes it could be that both of them work. And sometimes it could be that none of them work. It's imperative that you check your solutions. So it's, it's the best way to know uh, who's a party crasher and who's a genuine, authentic solution. Now, imagine we have two radicals in our equation. The square root of 2x plus 3 minus the square root of x plus 2 equals 2. Um, we could talk about the domain of this problem, right? Because we have to check our solution, just like with rational functions. We have to check our solutions to make sure they live inside the domain here, right? This radical right here is only defined when x is greater than or equal to negative 2. Um, a similar statement can be said for this radical as well. So if we solve the equation, find a number that's outside of their common domain, we have to throw it out. But there's also issues about the range, right? We have to make sure that these things combine in such a way that the range is correct as well. And keeping track of all of this can be difficult. So we're just gonna be like, I'm not gonna worry about it right now. I'll deal with that at the end of the problem. I'm just gonna check my solutions. Okay. Um, and, and just if we get a negative value for X, that does not necessarily mean that's a problem, right? This thing is defined when X equals negative one. Um, same thing right here. This is defined when X equals negative one. So we don't just throw out X because it's negative. It has to make sure that the left, hand side and the right hand side are both real numbers that are equal to each other. We have to agree with the domain and range. So how do you deal with two radicals? What if you have one? Well, the way you deal with radicals in algebra is the same way you deal with them if you are, you know, in a government, right? You want to separate the radicals and take them out one by one. I know it's kind of like a very violent solution, but you know, it paints a picture in your mind that you'll hopefully remember when you have to solve such an equation on an algebra test, right? So we want to separate the radicals, right? So move one of the radicals to the right-hand side. We end up with the square root of 2x plus 3 is equal to 2 plus the square root of x plus 2. And now because we have a square root on the left-hand side isolated, I want to get rid of it by squaring. But what's good for the goose is good for the gander. We have to do it to the right-hand side as well. When you square a square root, you will just get back the radicand, 2x plus 3. On the right-hand side, we do have to foil this thing out when you square something. 2 plus the square root of the square root of x plus 2 right there. You have to do it twice. You can't just distribute the exponent over addition. You have to foil it or use the binomial theorem. And so when you look at the foil there, you're going to get 2 times 2, which is 4. You're going to get 2 times the square root. So I'm just going to write that out. You'll get 2 times the square root again. So I'm actually just going to write that as a coefficient of 4 right there. And then you're going to get the square root times the square root, which when you multiply those together, you're actually getting the square root squared. So the square root of x plus 2 squared, which like we saw before, they cancel out. And so you actually just get x plus 2, like so. And so now you'll see that we started off with two square roots. We isolated one and squared it away. Now we have just one square root. And so what we're going to do is repeat this process. We want to isolate the square root. So we're going to move things to the other side. So we're going to subtract 4, goose and gander. We're going to subtract x, goose and gander. And then we're going to subtract the 2. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Separate all those things there. So you're going to get 2x minus x, which is an x. You're going to get 3 minus 4 minus 2, which is a negative 3. And then the right-hand side, you have 4 times the square root of x plus 2.
Now, if you want to get rid of the coefficient in four in front of the square root, you can do that by division, but I don't like needlessly introducing fractions into my equation if I can avoid it. So I'm actually going to leave it as a coefficient. We're going to square the left-hand side and the right-hand side to get rid of the square root on the right. So on the right-hand side, I'm going to start with that. You're squaring. Now you have to square the four and the square root. If you square the four, you're going to get a 16. And if you square the square root, you'll just get the radicand, x plus two. On the left-hand side, you do have the FOIL again. So you get x squared minus 6x plus 9. We now have a quadratic equation. And so we want to combine some like terms. I would first distribute the 16. So we get 16x plus 32. And then combining like terms, we'll just put everything equal to 0 on the right. So minus 16x minus 32. Minus 16x minus 32. Minus 16x minus 32. We end up with x squared minus 22x. Uh, minus 23 equals zero. We could solve this by completing the square of the quadratic formula, but I mean, factors of 23 that add up to be 22 here, I take negative 23 and then plus one. So the factorization is simple enough. So we end up with X equals 23 and negative one. So those are what we think are the solutions, but remember party crashers could be present. We need to come back to the original equation not any of the intermediate equations. We must go back to the original one. Check. Do those numbers work there? So if we try x equals 23, what happens there? Well, the left-hand side is going to look like the square root of 2 times 23 plus 3. Whoops, that looks like a 13 there. Plus 3 minus the square root of 23 plus 2. For which, as this simplifies, you're going to get 2 times 23 which is 46 plus three, which is 49. And then you're subtracting from that 23 plus two, which is 25. Uh, you end up with the square root of 49, which is seven, minus the square root of 25, which is five, and that's equal to two. So that actually, pan that, that's the right-hand side. So that, that works out. So 23 is a solution. Um, if we try X equals negative one, uh, the left-hand side will look like the square root of two times negative one plus three, and then we subtract from that the square root of negative one plus two. Now be aware there's, no, there's nothing wrong with the domains of these functions. Two times negative one is negative two plus three is one. So you get the square root of one. That's inside the domain of the square root. And negative one plus two is in fact one, right? So you get the square root of one and one, which is just one minus one, which is zero, which is not the same thing as two. So it turns out negative one didn't work, right? That was the party crasher that we anticipated. The only solution here is gonna be x equals 23. So when you work with radical equations, there are problems with the domain, which we, our potential solutions turned out to be okay there. We didn't have to take the square root of a negative ever. But you have to also worry about the problems with the range, that there's part of crash or that although negative one lives inside the domain of these two radicals, uh, it does not make the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side. And it's snuck in there because of these issues with range and square roots or and, and it's squaring functions not being one-to-one -one functions. So if you if you remember to check your solutions to look for party crashers, then you can solve these radical equations. You take the inverse power. So that to get rid of a square root, you take a square. To get rid of a cube root, you get a, you take a cube. To get rid of a fourth root, you take a fourth power. Uh, and that will then, we just have to make sure you check for party crashers and that'll solve these radical equations.